Chapter 1 A universally acknowledged truth prevails that a wealthy single man is inevitably in pursuit of a wife. Even if the sentiments and opinions of such a man remain obscure upon his initial arrival in a community, the conviction is so firmly rooted in the minds of the neighboring families that he is deemed the rightful prospect for marriage by one of their daughters. My dear Mr. Bennett, his lady addressed him one day. Have you heard the news that Netherfield Park has finally been let? Mr. Bennett confirmed that he had not. But it has, she declared, Mrs. Long just informed me of all the details. Mr. Bennett offered no response. Do you not wish to know who has leased it? His wife exclaimed impatiently. You wish to inform me, and I have no objection to hearing it. That was sufficient invitation. Well, my dear, you must be aware that Mrs. Long conveyed the information that Netherfield has been taken by a young man of considerable wealth from the north of England. He arrived on Monday in a carriage and four to inspect the property, and he was so impressed that he promptly reached an agreement with Mr. Morris. He is set to take possession before Michaelmas, and some of his staff will be in residence by the end of next week. What is his name? Bingley. Is he married or single? Oh. Single, my dear, undoubtedly. A single man of substantial fortune, four or five thousand a year. What an advantageous prospect for our girls. How so? How can it possibly concern them? My dear Mr. Bennett, his wife replied, how can you be so tedious? You must realize that I am contemplating the prospect of him marrying one of them. Is that his intention in establishing himself here? Intention? Nonsense! How can you speak in such a manner? But it is quite possible that he may develop an attachment to one of them. And therefore you must pay him a visit as soon as he arrives. I see no necessity for that. You and the girls can go, or you may send them on their own, which might be even more preferable. As you are as attractive as any of them, Mr. Bingley might favor you as the best among them. My dear, you flatter me. I may have possessed my share of beauty, but I make no claim to be extraordinary now. When a woman has five grown-up daughters, she should cease dwelling on her own appearance. In such situations, women often do not have much beauty to contemplate. But, my dear, you must indeed go and visit Mr. Bingley when he arrives in the vicinity. I cannot commit to that. I assure you. But think of your daughters. Consider what an advantageous match it could be for one of them. Sir William and Lady Lucas are resolute in attending, solely for that reason, as you know, they typically avoid newcomers. Indeed, you must go, as it will be impossible for us to call upon him if you refrain. You are excessively conscientious, surely. I am confident Mr. Bingley will be pleased to see you, and I will send a brief note with you to assure him of my enthusiastic approval for him to marry whichever of the girls he chooses. Although I must speak favorably of my little Lizzie, I insist you refrain from doing any such thing. Lizzie is not superior to the others, and I am certain she is not as attractive as Jane, nor as good-natured as Lydia. But you persist in favoring her. 
They don't have much to recommend them, he responded. They are all foolish and ignorant like other girls, but Lizzie possesses a bit more quickness than her sisters. Mr. Bennet, how can you speak ill of your own children like that? You seem to take pleasure in upsetting me. You show no consideration for my poor nerves. You misunderstand me, my dear. I hold your nerves in high regard. They are my old companions. I've heard you speak of them with care for at least twenty years. Ah! You have no idea what I endure. But I hope you'll overcome it and live to witness many young men with four thousand a year entering the neighborhood. It won't be of any use to us if twenty such men come since you won't visit them. Rest assured, my dear, that when there are twenty, I will visit them all. Mr. Bennet was an eccentric blend of quick wit, sarcastic humor, reserve, and capriciousness. Even after twenty-three years of marriage, his wife struggled to comprehend his character. Her own mind was less complex. She was a woman of limited understanding, scant information, and an unpredictable temper. When discontented, she imagined herself nervous. Her life's purpose was to marry off her daughters, finding solace in social visits and gossip. Chapter 2 Mr. Bennet was among the first to call on Mr. Bingley. He had always planned to visit, despite consistently assuring his wife that he wouldn't go. Until the evening after the visit, she remained unaware. The revelation occurred in the following manner. Noticing his second daughter working on a hat, he suddenly spoke to her. I hope Mr. Bingley will appreciate it, Lizzie. We have no way of knowing what Mr. Bingley likes, her mother retorted resentfully, since we are not allowed to visit. But you forget, Mama, Elizabeth pointed out, we will meet him at the assemblies, and Mrs. Long has promised to introduce him. I doubt Mrs. Long will do any such thing. She has two nieces of her own. She is a selfish, hypocritical woman, and I have no opinion of her. Nor do I, Mr. Bennett chimed in, and I'm glad to see that you don't rely on her assistance. Mrs. Bennett chose not to reply but, unable to contain herself, began scolding one of her daughters. Don't keep coughing so, Kitty for heaven's sake. Have a little compassion for my nerves. You tear them to pieces. Kitty has no discretion in her coughs, her father remarked, she times them poorly. I don't cough for my own amusement, Kitty retorted fretfully. When is your next ball, Lizzie? Two weeks from tomorrow. Yes, indeed, her mother exclaimed, and Mrs. Long won't be back until the day before, so it will be impossible for her to introduce him, as she won't even know him herself. Then, my dear, you may have the advantage over your friend and introduce Mr. Bingley to her. Impossible, Mr. Bennet, impossible, when I am not acquainted with him myself. How can you be so teasing? I admire your caution. A fortnight's acquaintance is indeed very little. One cannot truly know a man by the end of a fortnight. But if we do not make an effort, someone else will. After all, Mrs. Long and her nieces must take their chances. Therefore, since she would consider it a kindness if you decline the task, I will take it upon myself. The girls stared at their father. 
Mrs. Bennet only said, nonsense, nonsense. What could be the meaning of that emphatic exclamation? He asked. Do you consider the forms of introduction and the emphasis placed on them as nonsense? I cannot fully agree with you there. What do you say, Mary? You are a young lady of deep reflection, I know, who reads great books and makes extracts. Mary wanted to say something sensible but didn't know how. While Mary is collecting her thoughts, he continued, let us return to Mr. Bingley. I am tired of Mr. Bingley, his wife declared. I'm sorry to hear that, but why didn't you tell me earlier? If I had known this morning, I certainly wouldn't have called on him. It's very unfortunate, but as I have already made the visit, we cannot avoid the acquaintance now. The lady's astonishment was precisely what he desired, with Mrs. Bennet's possibly surpassing the rest. Though when the initial joy settled, she began insisting that she had expected it all along. How kind of you, my dear Mr. Bennet! But I knew I would persuade you eventually. I was certain you loved your girls too much to neglect such an acquaintance. How pleased I am! And what a good joke that you went this morning and never said a word about it until now. Now, Kitty, you can cough as much as you like, Mr. Bennett said, leaving the room as he spoke, fatigued by his wife's enthusiasm. What an excellent father you have, girls, she remarked after the door closed. I don't know how you'll ever repay him for his kindness, or me either, for that matter. At our age, it's not so enjoyable. I can tell you to be making new acquaintances every day. But for your sakes, we would do anything. Lydia, my love, even though you're the youngest, I'm sure Mr. Bingley will dance with you at the next ball. Oh! Lydia confidently exclaimed, I'm not afraid, for even though I'm the youngest, I'm the tallest. The rest of the evening was spent speculating about when Mr. Bennet would return Mr. Bingley's visit, and deciding when to invite him to dinner. Chapter 3 Despite Mrs. Bennet's best efforts, aided by her five daughters, she couldn't extract from her husband a satisfactory description of Mr. Bingley. They approached the subject with blatant questions. Clever suppositions and distant speculations, but he skillfully evaded all their efforts. Eventually, they had to rely on the second-hand information provided by their neighbor, Lady Lucas. Her report was exceedingly favorable. Sir William had been thoroughly impressed with Mr. Bingley, describing him as young, remarkably handsome, extremely pleasant. And, to top it all off, planning to attend the next assembly with a large party. It couldn't be more delightful. The notion that a fondness for dancing was a step toward falling in love raised lively expectations regarding Mr. Bingley's heart. If I can see one of my daughters happily settled at Netherfield, Mrs. Bennet expressed to her husband, and all the others married as well, I will have nothing left to wish for. In a few days, Mr. Bingley returned Mr. Bennet's visit, spending about ten minutes with him in his library. He had hoped to catch a glimpse of the young ladies whose beauty he had heard so much about. But he only saw the father. The ladies had a slightly better fortune, they observed from an upper window that he wore a blue coat and rode a black horse. An invitation to dinner was promptly sent, 
and Mrs. Bennett had already meticulously planned the menu to showcase her culinary skills when a letter arrived, deferring the gathering. Mr. Bingley was compelled to be in town the next day, making it impossible to accept their invitation, etc. Mrs. Bennett was thoroughly disconcerted. She couldn't fathom why he needed to be in town so soon after arriving in Hertfordshire. Fearing that he might be a perpetual wanderer, never settling in Netherfield as he should. Lady Lucas somewhat eased her worries by suggesting that he might have gone to London solely to arrange a grand party for the upcoming ball. Soon, a rumor circulated that Mr. Bingley intended to bring twelve ladies and seven gentlemen with him to the assembly. The girls lamented the large number of ladies, but their concerns were alleviated the day before. The ball when they learned that he had brought only six with him from London, his five sisters and a cousin. When the party entered the assembly room, it comprised only five individuals. Mr. Bingley, his two sisters, the elder sister's husband, and another young man. Mr. Bingley was handsome and carried himself like a gentleman, displaying a pleasant countenance and easy, unaffected manners. His sisters exuded an air of unmistakable fashion. His brother-in-law, Mr. Hurst, seemed to fit the gentlemanly mold. However, Mr. Darcy, his friend, quickly attracted the room's attention with his tall stature, handsome features. Noble bearing, and the rumor circulating within five minutes of his arrival that he had an income of ten thousand a year. The gentleman praised him as a fine figure of a man, while the ladies declared him much handsomer than Mr. Bingley. For about half the evening, he was admired until his manners turned the tide against him. It became evident that he was proud, aloof from his company, and uninterested in being pleased. Not even his extensive estate in Derbyshire could rescue him from acquiring a forbidding, disagreeable countenance, making him unworthy of comparison with his friend. Mr. Bingley quickly acquainted himself with the principal people in the room. He was lively, uninhibited, danced every dance expressed displeasure at the early closure of the ball and mentioned the possibility of hosting one at Netherfield. His amiable qualities spoke for themselves, creating a stark contrast with his friend, Mr. Darcy. Mr. Darcy danced only once with Mrs. Hurst and once with Miss Bingley, declined introductions to any other lady and spent the rest of the evening walking about the room, occasionally speaking with members of his own party. His character was established, he was the proudest, most disagreeable man in the world. Everyone hoped he would never return. Mrs. Bennet, in particular, harbored strong feelings against him, exacerbated by his slighting one of her daughters. Elizabeth Bennet, due to a scarcity of gentlemen, was obliged to sit out for two dances. During that time, she overheard a conversation between Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bingley, who momentarily left the dance to persuade his friend to join. Come, Darcy, urged Mr. Bingley, I must have you dance. I hate to see you standing about by yourself in this stupid manner. You had much better dance. I certainly shall not. You know how I detest it unless I am particularly acquainted with my partner. At such an assembly as this, it would be insupportable. 
your sisters are engaged, and there is not another woman in the room with whom it would not be a punishment to me to stand up. I would not be so fastidious as you are, exclaimed Bingley, for a kingdom. Upon my honor, I never met with so many pleasant girls in my life as I have this evening, and there are several of them uncommonly pretty. You are dancing with the only handsome girl in the room, Mr. Darcy remarked, looking at the eldest Miss Bennet. Oh! She is the most beautiful creature I ever beheld. But there is one of her sisters sitting down just behind you, who is very pretty, and I dare say, very agreeable. Do let me ask my partner to introduce you. Which do you mean? Turning around, he glanced for a moment at Elizabeth, then withdrew his own gaze and coldly said, She is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me. And I am in no mood to give consequence to young ladies who are slighted by other men. You had better return to your partner and enjoy her smiles, for you are wasting your time with me. Mr. Bingley followed his advice, Mr. Darcy walked away, and Elizabeth was left with less than cordial feelings toward him. Nonetheless, she recounted the story with great spirit among her friends, as her lively and playful disposition delighted in anything ridiculous. The evening passed pleasantly for the entire family. Mrs. Bennet witnessed her eldest daughter being much admired by the Netherfield party. Mr. Bingley danced with her twice, and she received attention from his sisters. Jane was gratified, though in a quieter manner. Elizabeth shared in Jane's pleasure. Mary overheard herself mentioned to Miss Bingley as the most accomplished girl in the neighborhood, while Catherine and Lydia were fortunate to always have partners, the only thing they cared about at a ball. They returned to Longbourn, their village and principal residence, in good spirits. Mr. Bennet, still awake, awaited them with a book, showing little regard for time. He was particularly curious about the outcome of the evening, which had generated such high expectations. He had hoped that all his wife's views on the stranger would be disappointed, but he quickly discovered a different story. Oh, my dear Mr. Bennet, she exclaimed upon entering the room, we had the most delightful evening and excellent ball. I wish you had been there. Jane was so admired, nothing could compare. Everyone commented on how well she looked, and Mr. Bingley thought her quite beautiful, dancing with her twice. Just think, my dear, he actually danced with her twice, and she was the only one he asked a second time. First, he asked Miss Lucas. I was so vexed to see him dance with her, but in any case, he did not admire her at all, indeed, nobody can, you know. He seemed quite taken with Jane as she descended during the dance. So he inquired about her, got introduced, and asked her for the next two dances. Then for the third and fourth, he danced with Miss King, the fifth and sixth with Jane again, and the seventh with Lizzie and the Boulanger. If he had any compassion for me, her husband impatiently interrupted, he would not have danced so much. For God's sake, no more talk about his partners. Oh, that he had sprained his ankle in the first dance. Oh, my dear, Mrs. Bennet continued, I am absolutely delighted with him. He is so excessively handsome, and his sisters are charming women. I have never seen anything more elegant in my life than their dresses. I'm sure the lace on Mrs. Hurst's gown. Here she was interrupted once again. Mr. Bennet protested against any discussion of finery. She was then forced to change the subject, sharing, with much bitterness and some exaggeration, the shocking rudeness of Mr. Darcy. 
But I can assure you, she added, that Lizzie does not lose much by not appealing to his taste. He is a most disagreeable, horrid man, not worth pleasing. So high and conceited that there's no enduring him. He walked here and there, imagining himself so very great. Not handsome enough to dance with. I wish you had been there, my dear, to give him one of your set-downs. I quite detest the man.